book of Isaiah, chapter 5, Sister Kathy said she thought maybe we'd get one of those long Bible studies, a bunch of doctrine, nobody knows what you're talking about anyway, so um, that's the kind of message I have planned for this morning. <coughs> Praise be to God. Understand we have a lot of good Bible readers ready to read the script, so let's read Isaiah chapter 5, 1 to 7. I'll read and then you can read all the other verses. God is saying through his prophet, he says, Now will I sing to my well-beloved a song of my beloved touching his vineyard. My well-beloved hath a vineyard and a very fruitful hill. Now, this is the father speaking to the son. And you and I are his vineyard. The book of Hebrews, it talks about the ground uh, where the rain comes often upon it. Yes, God has poured out his Holy Spirit upon us. And our brother saw this beautiful water of different colors and sparkling lights. That's what the Bible calls the living waters, the waters of eternal life. And how the ch children were zapped at the youth uh, camp. By the way, sign me up for girls camp next year. That sounds exciting. I want to go. Uh, God does bless his people. God does pour out his rain. God does send down the sunshine. Not because we're good. The Bible says God loves everybody. And he sends the rain and sends the sun on the good and on the bad. God just loves to bless us. Unfortunately, sometimes we have our umbrella up and the rain doesn't really uh, soak us very much. Someone said God often comes to visit us, but we're usually not at home. So some people don't get the blessings, but that's not because God doesn't send them. And so here the Father is speaking to the Son. My son, my well-beloved, has a vineyard and a very fruitful hill, and he fenced it. And he gathered out the stones thereof, and he planted it with the choicest vine, and built a tower in the midst of it, and also made a wine press therein. And he looked that it should bring forth grapes. You see, God, whatever he does in our lives, he does with an eternal purpose. And uh, he planted this in a very fruitful hill, even on Mount Zion. And he planted the choicest vine, the very best of his word, the best seed that there is. And he built a tower there, and he put watchmen. You remember how the, the master of the field came, and he saw a tree that was not bearing fruit. And he'd come year after year. And he said, well, I guess we'll have to cut it down. And the watchman said, no, sir, give it some more time. Let me dig around it, and let me put in some fertilizer. And then if it brings forth fruit, well... And if not, well, then we'll have to cut it down. And so he did all these things, and then he came and looked that it should bring forth grapes. And then this next part is so sad. It brought forth wild grapes. And now, O inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge, I pray you, betwixt me and my vineyard. What could have been done more to my vineyard than I have done in it? Wherefore, when I looked that it should bring forth grapes, brought it forth wild grapes. And now go to, I will tell you what I will do to my vineyard. I will take away the hedge thereof. You know God has hedged us about marvelously. The fact our brother Stafford's still alive, that's a miracle, but the fact that you and I are alive. We could have been killed. I've been in terrible automobile accidents. I was driving one time and the car was hit by a drunk driver and when I got I was standing outside and the car was actually a pancake I doubt that the whole car was more than a foot thick and there I was standing not a bump not a scratch nothing and I'm sure each one of us could testify here we have a second life and a third life and here we are God had hedged us about he said well I'll take away the hedge and it shall be eaten up who's going to eat it up the roaring lion the devil like a roaring lion walketh about stalking about seeking whom he may devour but God has put a hedge thus far, no further. You can do this, you can that, but don't touch his life, keep his life. But the time comes and says there's no more purpose. Break down the hedge, let it be eaten up. Break down the wall thereof and shall be trodden down. And I will lay it waste. It shall not be pruned nor digged. But there shall come up briars and thorns. I also command the clouds that they rain no more upon it. For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel. And the men of Judah, his pleasant plant. And he looked for judgment, but behold, oppression. He looked for righteousness, but behold, a cry or lament. Now we might wonder, did this really happen? Of course it did. Jerusalem was the praise of the whole earth. Kings from afar came to see the glory of the king of Israel and inquire at his wisdom. 
And they brought gold and they brought silver and they brought precious stones. And the whole world heard the fame thereof. And when the queen of Sheba came and saw the glory of King Solomon, she saw his servants standing there. How they ascended, how they came down, and how they stood, and how they were addressed, and how they uh, were cared for, and how they served. There's no more spirit left in her, because the kings were not arrayed like those, the servants. The servants of the king that God had placed upon his throne. And this is but a little shadow, just a passing shadow of the glory that God has prepared for you and me. But... God said that if they did not bring forth the fruit that he was looking for, that rather than the praise of the whole earth, Jerusalem would become a, 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 a rumor in the ears of the people that when they would pass by, they go, what has happened? How did this great glorious city come to this rubble? And they'll answer back because they did not bring forth the fruit that God had expected. So God does bless us. Oh, God blesses us wonderfully. God is good. God is rich. Out of That's why Jesus became poor, that out of his poverty we might become rich. He poured out his life unto death that we might live. He took our sins that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. He took away this evil spirit and gave us the Holy Spirit. And he's a very own spirit. He gave us a new heart and a new mind and filled us with the word of God. He sent us pastors after his own heart and he taught us the good word of the Lord. And he said, this is the way, walk ye in it. And some refuse to walk therein. And we presume upon the goodness of God. We say, well, God is good, God loves me, look, I was doing bad, and God filled me with the Holy Spirit, so I guess I'll go on sitting that grace may abound. Well, there is a day of judgment. The Apostle Paul says, knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. Yes, there is a day of judgment. Look in John chapter 15, and here we have this beautiful portion about Jesus, the vine, and we, the branches. He said, I am the true vine, my father is the husbandman. Now, listen carefully. Don't let these words escape. Let them sink down in the heart because these are not light words. These are the very words whereby we shall be judged on the day of judgment. Jesus said, I have a commandment. What I am to say, I've spoken what the Father told me to say. And the words that I speak, I know they were true. And these, he said, I'm not going to judge you on the day of judgment. I'm not going to judge you. My word will judge you. So we have to take the words of God very seriously. I am the true vine. My father is a husbandman. Every branch in me, every branch in me. Isn't it wonderful to be a branch? That St. Paul develops that theme. It was written up in our Pilgrim's Journal a while back, how we are cut out of the wild olive tree and grafted into the beautiful tree, which is Christ. And we talked there how grafting takes place. You have to cut the parent plant till it bleeds. Then you go over and cut off the wild branch until it bleeds also. And these two bleeding wounds, you join together and wrap them up. Uh, olden days they used to wrap them with a cloth soaked in oil nowadays they use a plastic also and put in a good oil there and they bind that together till the two become one till the life of the parent plant flows through the branch and Paul reminds us he says you don't bear the root the root bears you and if the root is holy then the branches must be holy also and we've been grafted into the good vine and that good life the life of Jesus Christ the very life of God comes flowing into our lives, every branch in me, isn't this wonderful? Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, purge, praise God, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. You see, God is looking for fruit. Jesus was walking with the disciples and they saw a fig tree. The Bible says Jesus was hungry. And he went to the tree to take some fruit to eat. And he saw no fruit thereon. The disciples heard him. He said, no more any man ever eat fruit of you. They came back the next day, and that tree was withered up. And they were shocked. They said, look, Master, behold, the tree that you cursed is withered up. And he says here in verse 3, now you are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Isn't that beautiful? The word of God comes to us and takes away all our sin, our filth, our garbage. Praise God. The girls were saying they have to confess their sin once and twice and three times before God zaps them. But the wonderful thing is God gives us, God cleanses us, and you feel so good. After get the blessing. Don't you feel good? God comes and prophesies, I love you, child. And you, you walk out uh, of the meek hall like walking out loud. You go home rejoicing in your heart, just singing and praising God, and you turn on the television and corrupt yourself. 
and defilement comes in and your mind is troubled and perversion comes and you lose the blessing and you wonder why didn't God keep me and God wonders why did you turn on the television set now you are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you abide in me abide in me that means remain remain in what you have keep that which you have hold tight to it I've given you eternal life I've given you the glory of God I've given you the wisdom of the throne of God, of the kingdom of God. I have revealed you the mystery of the kingdom of God. Hold it. Keep it. Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself except it abide in the vine, no more can ye except ye abide in me. You see, when we depart from the living God, then it's no wonder that sin starts to revive in our life. It's no wonder we start then to bring forth uh, manifestations of the devil in our lives. That's nothing unusual. That's normal. Because what is man without God? Nothing at all. From dust thou art, to dust thou shalt return. I am the vine, and ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him. Ah, here we are. Isn't that beautiful? Let's read this verse 5 together. I am the vine, you are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me you can do nothing. The same bringeth forth much fruit. The same bringeth forth much fruit. Praise be to God. Fruit bearing is normal, it's natural for the branch that abides in the vine. Verse 6, if a man abide not in me, is cast forth as a branch and is withered, and men gather them and cast them into the fire and they are burned. There are plenty of men like that, there are plenty of women like that. Your friends at school, your friends at work, your husband, your wife, your friends, your neighbors, or the man speaking to you on the television. Somebody along the line will be glad to gather you up and help lead you into the furnace of fire where you'll be burned up. Verse 7, abide in me and my words abide in you. You shall ask what you will and it shall be done. Praise be to God. In Matthew chapter 7, oh, the Lord told so many stories, so many parables about these things that we can't begin even a couple hours to read them all. But in Matthew chapter 7 from verse 15, beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are raven wolves. You shall know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? Even every, even so, every good tree that bringeth forth good fruit, uh, every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. Wherefore, by their fruits ye shall know them. So the Lord does not know us by our blessing. The Lord does not know us by what church we belong to. He does not know us by who our pastor is. One brother we had to put out of the church some time ago because he was living in immorality. And when it was discovered, we called him in and talked to him, and he said, well, I've been doing this all my life. But he said, I was baptized by pastor so-and-so. When I was a baby, I was dedicated by pastor so-and-so. I was baptized by the chief pastor, and uh, later on became the chief pastor. I was married by pastor so-and-so, and, and uh, uh, I received the Holy Spirit when pastor so-and-so prayed for me. And, and I've been in this church so long, and my mother was a worker. I forget all the things going on and on and on and on. Well, that's what they did to Jesus. They said, Abraham is our father, and, and we, we are building the sepulchres of the prophets and all those things. Jesus said, that's of no value whatever at all. I've come to look the fruit of your life. Maybe I've told you before probably about this book written by Dr. Raymond Ritchie called, I think it's called Back from Tomorrow. No, it's, I'm sorry. Back from Death, I think, or something. And he wrote about his own experience. Uh, Dr. Stafford was a medical doctor. And he died in a hospital. And uh, he was dead for 10 minutes, it's written on the chart. And when he died, his spirit came out of his body, and all the doctors there trying to revive him. He wanted to tell him, don't worry about me, I'm all right. But then he got disinterested in him again, spirit began to go away. And uh, I can't tell all the story, but uh, he noticed a person beside him and took him to uh, a beautiful place. It was like a large city, but it was like a university. And uh, everybody was dressed in white, and they were all so very happy there. And um, they were studying like the sciences, but it was a science way beyond any sciences that we know in this world. And music, he said, music, a different kind of music, oh, so much more beautiful. And the arts and so many things they were studying. And as they came by, this person by him, which he discerned was Jesus, was showing him these different things. And the people would stop what they were doing, and they would turn toward Jesus, and they'd worship him and say, thank you, Jesus. Then they go back to the work, and Jesus would show them something else. 
And he knows how happy they were and peaceful and beautiful and clean and holy they all were. But as Jesus was saying, look at this and look at this, he began to look more and more toward Jesus. And Jesus would say, look at this, and he wouldn't look, he'd look at Jesus. And he began to get more interested in Jesus than all these things. And finally he said, Lord, don't you have a people that love you more than all these things? And he said, Jesus smiled with a great big smile. He said, oh, yes. And then Jesus looked up. So he looked up. And way, way up in the sky, he saw what he said. He saw a beautiful city, a city of light. But then he said, as he saw it, he saw it wasn't built out of stones, it was the people. And rays of light were coming from that city down to Jesus, and rays of light from the face of Jesus going up to that city. And oh, his heart thrilled, and he said, Jesus, can I go there? And Jesus said, no, you're not ready yet. And then he came back down, came back down, back into the hospital, and he trying to find his body. He couldn't find his body. He went to one room and another room and another room. He saw several bodies with a sheet pulled over. He tried to get in, but he couldn't. <laughs> Finally, he went to room, one room and he, he saw a, a, a hand had fallen out, covered over the sheet, but the hand had fallen out. He saw his school ring there. He knew that was his body. That was the last thing he remembered. And then he was revived. And on the chart, it wrote he was dead for 10 minutes. But what I want to tell you, besides the story of the city, which is exactly what the Bible shows us, that people who love Jesus more than all of these things. Another doctor, Dr. Saban, read that report, and he said, well, I've had patients that have told me stories like that too. So he began to write a book, and he investigated, I think it was 174 people who had died and come back to life again, clinically dead, they call it. And their stories were amazingly similar. Now, since that book was written, many others have written books too, apparently all over the world. And uh, people are counting thousands of testimonies like this. But this doctor did careful research. And he more or less says the stories are more or less the same. This is what I wanted to tell. That when they die, they come out of their body, maybe in an automobile accident in a hospital or someplace, an operating room. And uh, they see people frantically, uh, frantically trying to revive them. And they want to say, no, don't worry about me, I'm all right. But they cannot talk. So uh, they cannot communicate. They won't, they can, they, people cannot hear them talking. So then gradually they lose interest and they go away and they go through like a dark tunnel and they come out to a beautiful place. It's all bright, like a beautiful field. And they're moving swiftly along that field toward the borderline. They realize if they cross that border, they'll never come back anymore. But none of them ever cross the border. But as they reach the border, a person comes to meet them. Uh, some people call that a being of light. That's a general term. Some thought it was Jesus. Some thought it was Moses. Some didn't know who it was, according to their religious background and so forth. Now, these are not all Christian people by any means. Many of them are unsaved, Jewish, and so forth and so on. But this person of light comes. This is the part I wanted to tell. As this person comes, and they come there toward that person, to the borderline, that person is coming to meet them. This is what they said. I think it's beautiful. They said they felt that person was altogether love. And they felt that person was happy to see them. He, he wanted them to come to him. But as they came closer... He didn't speak, but a question overwhelmed them. This was the question. What have you done with your life to show me? What have you done with your life to show me? And they, realizing they could not give a positive answer, they shook away, drew back, and went away from him, went back down through the tunnel and came back into their bodies again. There is a day coming, St. Paul says, knowing the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that we may give account to every one of us for what we have done in our body. Judgment will not be according to the blessings. Only in this sense, the more blessings we have received, the more fruit is expected. To whom much is given, much is expected. The Lord told us in many different parables and many different stories. We don't have time to look at it all, but uh, look in Second Peter in chapter 1. Peter tells us here that how God has given us everything from verse 2, grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, according as his divine power has given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue. Do you realize what we have? Dr. Stafford, do you realize what you have in having received the Holy Spirit of God? This is God's treasure. This is God's own divine nature. This is God's old eternal spirit, the spirit of eternity, coming to dwell in a little mortal body. Can this be? This is called the mystery of godliness. But we know it's true because we saw Jesus, God, dwelling in mortal flesh. And God has come unto you and me, God Almighty. 
God holy, holy, holy. God beautiful, God glorious. God humble, God meek, God lowly. God great, God powerful, God all eternal. God, the only God, dwells in you and me. Whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises that by these we might be made partakers of the divine nature, having escaped, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Beloved, we don't have any choice. This is enjoined upon us. You and I have to flee from corruption. We have to flee from the corruption of this world and lay hold upon eternal life unto which God has called us. St. Paul said, I don't count myself yet to have apprehended but this one thing I do, reaching forward. See, if I can get a hold of, if I can win that for which Christ has called me. You see, the blessings are only the first part. The last part is, what do we have to show? What is the fruit of our lives? Judge between me and my vineyard. What more could I have done for my vineyard than I have done? But when I came and looked for grapes, what did I find? Thorns and thistles, sour grapes. No, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. And besides all this, giving diligence, add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge, and to knowledge temperance, and to temperance patience, and to patience godliness, and to godliness of brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness charity. For if these things be in you and abound, they make you that you shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That you should not be barren. That you should not be stand before God embarrassed, empty-handed, like a dried-up twig. You fit only to be cast into the fire and burned. The Lord told the story about the man. He gave five talents. He gave two talents. He gave one talent. Fine. Praise God. One man had more blessings than another, and another had less than the others. But they all were given something, some blessing they got. And I thrill when I hear some of the testimonies of you. I've never had some of those blessings. Wow. I don't think I've ever been drunk in the spirit and danced outside the meeting hall. I don't know what that is. I've danced inside sometimes, but I'm not very much given to dancing. I don't know. But uh, I think that's wonderful. God's giving you some of five talents, ten talents, and I've only got one or two. Well, praise God, but I better multiply what I've got because when the Lord came, he didn't give more rewards to the man that had the ten, the five, and the one. He just asked, where's the fruit? And one man that had five, he said, Lord, you gave me five here. The five you gave me, and five more, Lord. Oh, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a little. Enter into the joy of that. And the man came to whom God had given two talents. And he said, Lord, here are the two, and here are two more that I gave. Well done. They said the same thing. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a little. Enter into the joy of thy Lord. Then came to the man there the one talent. I don't know, maybe he said, well, Lord, I never went to youth camp. I never got two or three talents. I only got one. I never got born again. I never got baptized in water. I never got the Holy Spirit. I never had a healing in my life. I never prophesied, Lord. I only got saved. Well, pray God. You were born again, became a child of God. Wonderful. What do you have to show? Well, really, um, um, well, I, um, 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 I hid in the ground, or here it is. Well, that's nice. Is that what the Lord said? Okay, you're saved. You can come on in. He said, oh, you wicked and slothful. You know what slothful means? Lazy. Wicked and slothful servant. He said, yeah, but the reason I didn't do anything is because I knew you were a hard master. You reap where you haven't sown. You gathered where you haven't strong. And the Lord said, that's true. You know that is? Here I work and preach and preach and work in Newark, and God sends revival over there to, to, to uh, North Carolina someplace or Texas someplace. Sometimes we think that. What's the use of me? Pray? I pray and pray and pray and pray, and somebody else gets healed. Huh? And I pray and I hear about revival over in Papua New Guinea. We're not having revival in here. Praise God, we're having revival there too. I was there a few weeks ago. By the way, Brother Joe's doing well there. Do pray for him. He's kind of lost his voice, but he's very happy there. Pray for Sister Jennifer too. She was up in the mountains in Mount Hagen. You probably saw some of the photographs we had of Mount Hagen. And uh, that's a place up in the mountains where we have a number of churches. And. Uh, Oh, it's beautiful up there with, with the dear people, and lovely people, beautiful people. You know, it's a joy to teach the Word of God there. And I noticed when the first time I was teaching, all the men would sit there like this the whole time. I thought, boy, they look mad or something. <laughs> and uh, I was talking about serving God, then I said, now, anybody interested in serving God, come up afterwards and talk to me, and nobody came. And so I was wondering, boy, I wonder if they even understood me. Then the next morning in the meeting, I was preaching again, and I noticed a lot of the men were kind of sleeping off. So Brother Rick said, well, after your message last night, they stayed up all night talking about the message. That's why they're kind of tired this morning. Then that afternoon, one by one, they all came, the whole church, 
came and talked to me. They said, Brother, we heard what you taught, taught last night, and we've decided, yes, it's our due to serve God, so we have come to offer ourselves to the ministry of the whole church. And I realize those people take the things of God seriously, beautifully. And it was a joy there to teach and serve amongst them. But there is the problem, we've told you, about the fighting there. You know, there used to be cannibals that killed and eat. Now they just kill each other. They don't eat anymore. And um, we had one brother there. He, his name was John. Do pray for him, a dear brother. He killed three people. And uh, lastly, he killed his wife. And then he thought, well, that's not a very nice thing to do. So he picked up the body and walked several miles to the police station and said, look what I did. And so they put him in jail for eight months, and now he's out again. He has a new wife, and, but she's not afraid of him because now he's saved and filled with, filled with the Holy Spirit. And he comes to all the meetings smiley, has a great big smile, <laughs> really loves the Lord. But when Sister Jennifer was there, she just came back last Friday, I believe it was, she said there's fighting going on up there again. Eight people were killed right around where she was ministering. And people fled into the house where she was staying there seeking for refuge. And uh, you say, well, boy, that's a pretty wild place. That's almost as bad as Newark, isn't it? And as you go out the door, you'll find a bullet hole in the door there. Uh, night before last, people shooting out there. They had to wipe the blood off the sidewalk. It's almost like Papua New Guinea. So wherever you are, it's time to serve the Lord because we don't know how long we're going to be here. And I talked to the workers there. Sister, do pray for Sister Thelma also. She's not keeping well. She has some kind of a fibroid tumor, but she's working day and night. And I said, do you want to come back to America? She said, no, I want to die here in Papua New Guinea. And I asked Brother Ricky if he wanted to come back. She said, no, I want to die here in Papua New Guinea. And look what it says in John chapter 12. John chapter 12. John chapter 12. If someone would like to read from verse 24 to 26, please. Verily, verily, I say unto you, Except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone. But if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. He that loveth his life shall lose it, and he that hateth his life in this world shall keep it unto life eternal. If any man serve me, let him follow me. And where I am, there shall also my servant be. If any man serve me, him will my father honor. Except a corn of wheat fall in the ground and die, it abideth alone. What's the purpose of the corn of wheat? It's to fall into the ground and die so that it may bring forth much fruit. That's why you and I were saved, that we may bring forth much fruit. So this man said, Lord, you're a hard master. You don't need me. You can reap a harvest someplace else. I don't have to work for you. The Lord said, I'll judge you by your own words. You wicked, slothful uh, servant. Cast him in outer darkness. There'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. I've seen people that have missed God's purpose in life. I've seen them weep. I've seen them gnash their teeth. And I had no words of comfort to give them. It's a pathetic thing. They had been blessed. Oh, God had blessed them. Been brought up in a good godly family. Had the word of God from childhood. Received salvation. Received baptism of the Spirit. Received the Holy Spirit. Received certain gifts and blessings from God. But they had corrupted themselves. And they had missed the calling. They had sold their heritage for a mess of pottage. And I've seen them weep. And I can imagine what it will be like throughout eternity. Oh, why did I do it? Oh, why didn't I do the will of God? And weeping and gnashing teeth. And befolding far off the joy of the redeemed and the glory of the city and the beauty of the mountain. And living in the torment of our own defilement and corruption. What a heartache that would be. But the corn of wheat has to fall in the ground and die. And there's the problem. I want to do my own will. I want to go my own way. I have want to do this. I want to get that. When we stand before the Lord, we'll come with all kinds of things. Well, Lord, I got my degrees, and Lord, I bought a big house, and then I bought another one, Lord, and I got a new car, Lord, and then I got migrated to that other country, Lord, and I, and I got a better job, Lord, and I got, uh, I got married, Lord, and then I got married again, Lord, and I got two or three children, I got five more over there, I got 22. That's nothing. The Lord will say, I'm not interested, I'm not interested. Where's the fruit of what I gave you? Where's the fruit of the Spirit? Where's the fruit of the Word of God? Where's the fruit of the vine coming out of your life? What do you have to show me for your life? I don't care for all that stuff. All the unsaved of the world, they have all that. All the atheists, all the, the unbelievers, they have all of that. That's one thing in America now. They've been preaching so long this gospel of prosperity. That's right from the very pit of hell. The most prosperous religious people in the world, they are the Muslims, and they're prospering all over the world. I was recently in Brunei, a fabulous country. 
and you ought to see the wealth of the king, their oil country. That's what the Muslims say. God gave us all this oil money, money to spread Islam around the world. And that's what they're doing. It's fantastic what they're doing. In that country, they poured billions of dollars in that country and built fabulous mosques. Some of the most beautiful mosques in the world are there in Brunei. And I was called there by a Christian man, a dear beloved brother. He loves God all of his heart. And he said, Brother, I'm trying to organize some meetings, getting the Christians together. You're not allowed to take the Bible in the country. They're not allowed to have any church or anything. And he said, oh, we, we cannot get together because we're all divided. And I went there and I found it true. One believer said, why do you invite that believer? If you invite that believer again, I won't come. And all divided, divided. I said, brother, you cannot do a thing here. There's no godliness here. Everybody says they're a prophet. Everybody says they're a pastor. Everybody says they're a preacher. They cannot look two in the face and love each other. And I said, are there no real Christians in this country? And he said, oh, yes, there are. But they're the tribal people. Nobody cares for them. I said, God does. Let's find them. And we found them. And oh, they love Jesus. <clears throat> they are a people filled with God. It was beautiful. And they told us about the tribal people next door in Sabah. That's another country. They're on the, this all on the island of Borneo. And we went there. We, we, uh, we went there to the tribal people in Sabah. And oh, I tell you, it was beautiful. They love God. And we started to preach the Word of God. We went on for hours. Now, don't look at the clock, please, children. But I preached for nine hours. And we could have gone on. And they loved it. And the pastor, I know they have two pastors there, they weren't taking notes. And the next day, Sunday morning, when we got together, the pastor got up and said, I thank God yesterday he answered all my questions and he repeated the whole bible study all the points that i had given he had remembered the whole thing for nine hours and i tell you those people loved the word of god and they rejoiced and they wept and they howled and we went up the mountain to pray together you remember how brother rick had hiked for 12 hours through the mountains in papua new guinea um, borneo is right next to papua new guinea if you look on the map it's a large island almost as large as papua new guinea and uh, tribal people all through there, and, and the gospel is spreading like in Papua New Guinea, all through those countries and islands, thousands and thousands of islands. We could send a, we could send a thousand missionaries there right now, and it wouldn't be, just barely scratch the surface of the work that needs to be done there. I suppose a thousand missionaries would, but it would be beautiful. So many tribes, so many villages, and uh, I told, please, I want to hike to the village called Man. Were you for 12 hours? He said, no, brother, darn, too old, you'll never make it. I said, yes, I can, yes, I can. So I got there to Sama. And they told me about this mountain there, and the tribes, I said, let's go. So I, uh, they were huffing and puffing, I said, I'm going to show them. And I ran up the mountain and swung on the vines and leaped over the, the rivers and the rocks. And after 12 minutes, I was finished. <laughs> but they took me up the mountain there to a place out there under the stars. And they said, brother, this is where we seek God. This is where we pray to get away from the eyes of the authorities. It's a Muslim country. But they said, this is where we come, and this is where God visits us. And you could tell that was a place that had been wet with the tears of people rejoicing at the feet of Jesus. The tribal peoples are pretty well rejected. The Muslims don't care about them. Let them do what they want to do. And most of them are Christians, like in Papua New Guinea. I tell you, God is, God is moving all over the face of the world. Maybe God is having to bypass America because this is a land where he's poured out his rain and he's caused his sun to shine. And God has manifested his goodness year after year after year after year. And what is the fruit of it? Listening to a broadcast on family radio a few days ago, I just heard a little bit of it. I don't know who the speakers were. But they were very well-educated people. One was questioning another. Maybe one was Dr. James Dobson. I don't know. And he asked the other man, he says, well, what, what is going on? And, or what are the statistics? And he said, they're very bad. Family violence. 60% of, 68%, I believe it was, of all families in America have violence. And he gave the percentage of the number of wives that are being beaten by their husbands. The number of children being molested by their fathers or by their uncles. And uh, I went to one of our churches recently and uh, we had to excommunicate a brother for beating his wife. And the other brother said, you can't do that, Pastor. I said, yes, we do. This is totally incompatible with Christianity. And he said, well, brother, we all do that. Another brother said, well, how about when the wife beats the husband? I said, my God, what do we have here? And this broadcast I was listening to, this 
man who's asking the questions, after he's told about all this violence and child molesting, he said, well, how is it in the Christian churches? And this man with the facts and statistics answered, it's just as bad or worse. You think God is pleased? I tell you, God is grieved. The heart of God is broken. The heart of God is bleeding in pain when he looks at his beautiful vineyard. And what does he see? We have husbands in our churches that are unfaithful to their wives. I tell you, husbands, you'll never see the glory of God. I tell you, you'll weep and howl and gnash your teeth forever in the pit of hell. Listen to me. We have uncles here who molest your nieces. We have uh, husbands here who beat your wives. I got a phone call from my husband pleading with me to call his wife so she'll come back home. She's fled to refuge in a refuge center because he was beating on her, supposedly a member of our church. I said, no, I won't call her to tell her to come back home because the worker in the city where she is told her not to come back to you. And uh, what, what's going on? Young people get blessed. They get zamped at the youth camp. Then they go out and buy these dirty videos and stay home and watch them all night long on television. Playing, we're playing f the fool before God. I tell you, God's not a fool. We're the fool. And there is a day of judgment coming. And God is going to look to see what is the fruit. And that corn of wheat that has, has that beautiful life in it. And I love to study the sciences. And we're writing little articles in our Pilgrim's Journal about science and scriptures. But the scientists stand amazed life. A little corn of wheat. Just a little combination of carbohydrates and proteins that the uh, scientists can duplicate in the laboratory. They can make a corn of wheat just like but a little difference. The corn of wheat that God made, the same chemicals that the chemists can put together, but there's something in there called life. The scientists don't know what it is. Something's moving inside that. It moves in a figure like this, and if you know mathematics, that's the figure of what? Eternity. That represents eternity, infinity, the life of God. The life of God. And that life is in you in a much greater measure. The very Spirit of God, the very life of the Son of God is living in your heart and in your, in, 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 in your soul, in your spirit. And God has come to dwell in our bodies. Our bodies are the temple of the Holy Ghost. The Bible tells us we should give our bodies. He says, I beseech you, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you give your bodies as a living sacrifice unto God that you may know what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God, because only those that do the will of God will enter into eternal life. Oh, many will come in that day saying, Lord, Lord, we prophesied in thy name, we cast out devils in your name, we preached, we did so many wonderful things in your name. The Lord will say, Depart from me, ye workers of iniquity. Only those that do the will of God shall enter into the kingdom of God. And this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that you would abstain from fornication. Beloved, what God has given us is the greatest treasure in all the earth. And this man, when he found this one pearl of a great price, he sold everything to buy that one pearl. Buy the truth and sell it not. You have only what one life and it's soon passed. Only what's done for Christ will I. What are you going to show the Lord? Well, Lord, I know you blessed me and I know I got blessed, Lord, but I had to do my studies. I had to get my career. I had to do this. I had to do... No, you didn't. You had to occupy yourself in your salvation with fear and trembling. You had to do the will of God. You had to seek the mind of God and seek the counsel of God. Last night, Dr. Stafford was asking, what is the will of God? He says, when I contemplate doing this thing, which I think may be God's will, I feel real peace inside. But my friends come and say, no, do this and get that and go here and do that and all kinds of things. But then I lose my peace. You lose your peace, you lose God because God is the God of peace. That's how you know the will of God. Yeah, but the will of God, I won't get rich, I won't get famous, I won't get this, I won't get that. But you get eternal life. And you get the glory of God. You get the kingdom of God. You get him to say, well done, a good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over little. I'll put you over much. Enter into the joy of thy Lord. Under the kingdom which thy father has prepared for thee. Beloved, life is fast, fast, fast. I never realized until I got old. One time in London, we went to see an old sister. She was about 90 years old. She was very weak and feeble. Pastor Wesley and I, or Pastor T. U. Thomas and I went to see her. We said, Sister, uh, we'd like you to give us a key to your house. We'll keep it at the faith home. You know, in case something happens to you, we can come and get in. You're getting very old. Uh, old! She said, no. She said, I'm the same person I was when I was three years old. I remember very clearly. And I realize that's true. Age doesn't solve the problem. We're all getting old very quickly. 
Some of you young people might not be alive here next year, might not be around for camp next year. We have no guarantee on our life. Our doctor of Stafford almost died. He has a second life or a third life. Here he is. How much longer? We don't know. Just time enough to do the will of God. That's all. Just time enough to get ready to meet the Lord Jesus Christ. Just time enough to look up and say, Lord, here I am, O oh God. I'm ready, Lord God. What is thy will, O oh God? I delight to do thy will, O oh God. I delight, delight to run in the way of thy commandments, O oh God. What is the purpose of my life? My purpose is that you bring forth fruit. Fruit unto holiness and the end thereof, eternal life. My purpose is that you should be fruitful. So the Lord said to this man that did not multiply his talent, you should have given my talent to the money exchangers. Then I could come and have usury. Who are these money changers? Look in the book of Philippians. book of Philippians, Paul is writing to this church there. And... Uh, they had sent to him on his missionary journeys, and he was grateful for that. He says here in verse 12, chapter 4, Philippians chapter 4, verse 12, I know both how to be abased and I know how to abound. Now he's talking about financial blessings. He'd gone through hardships. He'd had an abundance. All those things we know. We've gone hungry. We've gone days and faith home with nothing to eat. We've had critics come and say, well, where's your God? Where's food? Where's your money? Why can't you buy a car? It works. Uh, you thought you had a big car. They laughed at us. Then they'd have, we have an abundance. We have big cars and a lot of food to come and criticize. Yeah, you're living a life, aren't you? They criticize. You can't win. I mean, you're going to criticize one way or another. So Paul had it both. He said, I know how to be based. I know how to abound. Everywhere in all things I'm instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. Let's all read verse 13 together. I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. Then he said, Nevertheless, notwithstanding, you have well done that you did communicate with me in my affliction. In other words, you sent me an offering when I was in need. Now, you Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no church communicated with me as concerning giving and receiving, but ye only account. I desire fruit that may abound to your account. I learned this lesson, I think I've told this story many times, I might be telling again for the youth that are here, when I first went off to the mission field, well, not the first time, but I was being sent from Los Angeles to Argentina, and I did not know where Argentina was, I had to go look on a map to see where it was, I knew nothing about it at all, I had planned to go to Turkey as a missionary, and they came and said, brother, we're sending you to Argentina, I said, fine, I'll go wherever the Lord sends me, and they had a farewell uh, send-off meeting, At the end of the meeting, uh, a little old lady came and gave me a one dollar bill. She said, here, this is for the mission field. I was humiliated. That was the first offering I'd ever received in all my life, and I was embarrassed. And I said, oh, Lord, you, I said, old lady, you need this more than I do. I can't take it here. Uh, please take it back. And she put her finger in my face. She said, you listen to me, young man. I can't go to the mission field like you can. I'm not giving this for you. I'm giving this for the mission field. Go and win souls for me or for my account. And I, I learned a lesson. I said, yes, ma'am, and I took it. And uh, I desire fruit may abound to your account. Some of you cannot go to the mission field. That's true. Some of you may, uh, may not be able to go because of circumstances in your life. But you can pray and you can invest your life and you can invest your resources in those that can go. Give to the bankers that with... When I come, I might have my own with usury. There might be some increase. We're going to close with a few verses in Isaiah. I'm abbreviating the whole message today because of a lack of time. But I do pray that God will speak to our hearts. Here in the book of Isaiah, so many places we could read. Isaiah 54, for example. From verse 1, Sing, O barren, thou that didst bear. Break forth into singing and cry aloud, thou that didst not travail with child. For more are the children of the desolate than the children of the married wife, saith the Lord. My father, the last time I saw him, he was about 90 years old. And, oh, he used to rail at me. And he pointed at me, he said, you're sinning, you're sinning, you're sinning. I want you to get married. I want to have grandchildren. That's true. I have no children. My daddy had three. I have thousands and thousands of children. The children of the desolate are more than the children of the married. Verse 2, enlarge the place of the tent and let them stretch forth the curtains of the habitation. Spare not, lengthen the cord, strengthen the stakes, for thou shalt break forth on the right hand and on the left, and thy seed shall inherit the Gentiles. Make the desolate cities be inhabited. Fear not, for thou shalt not be ashamed, neither be thou confounded, for thou shalt not be put to shame, for thou shalt 
forget the shame of thy youth and shall not remember the reproach of thy widowhood anymore for thy maker is thy husband and the Lord of hosts is his name and thy redeemer the Holy One of Israel the God of the whole earth shall be he be called praise be to God I tell you God has a plan for your life and God has a plan for my life I'm not talking against marriage but in the hours and pain and suffering to bring up one physical child you can bring up hundreds of spiritual children uh, praise be to God for the children that he gives us we have to bring them up in the fear and admonition of the Lord and present them before the Lord also but how beautiful it is to win souls and have a spiritual family to have spiritual children to present before the Lord Praise be to God. Isaiah chapter 58. Praise be to God. We've had fasting and prayers, and that's good to buffet the flesh and try and get into the spirit, let the spirit take uh, precedence in our lives. But here, let's read together verses 6 to 8. Isaiah 58, 6 to 8. Is not this the fast that I have chosen, to loose the bands of wickedness, to undo the heavy burdens, and to let the oppressed go free, that you break every yoke? Is it not to deal thy bread to the hungry, and that thou bring the poor that are cast out of thy house? When thou seest the naked, that thou cover him, and that thou hide not thyself from thine own flesh. Then shall thy light break forth as the morning, and thine health shall spring forth speedily, and thy righteousness shall go before thee, and the glory of thy Lord shall be thy rear reward. You know, the Lord told about the sheep and the goats. That speaks of the day of judgment. Yes, there is a day of judgment. Every one of us will stand before the judgment seat of Christ that we may receive according to the things that we've done in our bodies. Every one of us must answer personally to the Lord. And what a day that will be. That will be surprises. Oh, my. Many will come and say, Lord, Lord. And the Lord will say, Depart from me. Only those who do the will of God shall enter the kingdom of God. But he tells you, He's going to separate. Some on his right hand, some on his left hand. And they will be separated, not according to what church they went to, not according to what blessings they had, not according to who their pastor was, not according to how many years in the faith. They're separated according to what they did in the body, what they did with their lives. Blessed are you, beloved of the Father, because when I was hungry, you fed me. When I was thirsty, you gave me to drink. When I was naked, you clothed me. When I was in prison, you visited me. When I was... Um, sick you came and visited me and they said Lord when did we see you hungry and feed you when did we see you in prison and visit you the Lord said inasmuch as you did it unto one of the least of these my brethren you did it unto me and on the left hand he said when I was sick and needy and hungry and in prison you did not care to minister to me they said Lord we never saw you sick and hungry and in prison if we had seen you we surely would have done it the Lord said, but you did not do it to your fellow man. I was in San Francisco recently. I've never seen the church so happy. Brother and sister, one after another, came and said, oh, we're so happy. And I wondered why. I said, what is it? We're going to the prison every week. We're ministering into the prison. We pack up lunches and we take them in clothing and things and writing pads and different things they want. We take them there. We go in and we have a meeting. Then we go and talk to them in their cells. And oh, to see the joy on their face when we talk to them about Jesus and pray for them and take letters to their families and bring them little gifts and so forth. What is that joy? That's the joy of serving Jesus. The joy of reaching out to help somebody else. You know, if we live only for ourselves, we die. He that seeks to save his own life will lose it. But isn't that what we're doing? Planning all day long. Well, if I get this studies and I get that degree, I'll make more money and I'll get a better job. And if I move there, I get a bigger house and get more money over there. And I can send my wife out to work and I can send my son out to work. I can send my daughter out to work and send the baby out to work. And we'll make more money and we'll buy a... If we live for ourselves, we'll die. And we are dying, dying, dying. So many of God's people are shriveling up. They're dying. And sin is taking over their lives because they're living for themselves. But he that loses his life for my sake in the Gospels, he that loses his life, I lost. Ha, I end up with nothing. I haven't got a thing. No possessions, no dwelling place, no family, nothing. He finds it. He finds it unto life eternal. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over little. I'll put you on much. Oh, so many beautiful verses in Isaiah. Let's sit down a bit more here in chapter 60. Arise. Let's read together verses 
1 and 2. Arise, shine, for thy light has come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon thee. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth, and gross darkness the people. But the Lord shall rise upon thee, and his glory shall be seen upon thee. What does it say? And the Gentiles shall come to thy light, and kings to the brightness of thy rising. Lift up thine eyes round about, and see all they gather themselves together, they come to thee. Thy son shall come from far, and thy daughter shall be nursed at thy side. And then thou shalt see and flow together, and thine heart shall fear and be enlarged, because the abundance of the sea, or the isles of the sea, shall be converted unto thee, and the forces of the Gentiles shall come unto thee. They'll come from Papua New Guinea, they'll come from the island of Mushu. Praise God, we have Brother Mark here today, because Sister Joyce went to the island of Mushu. Hallelujah. That's one of her sons, praise be to God. And some of you prayed also, some of you offered that we might send missionaries out like that. These are your children, and they'll come. And uh, you'll be surprised when you see them come, coming from far away and coming from different places. Look in verse 8. Who are these that fly as a cloud and as the doves to their window? Surely the isles shall wait for me and the ships of Tarshish first to bring thy sons from afar, their silver and their gold with them, unto the name of the Lord thy God, to the house of the Holy One of Israel, because he hath glorified thee, and the sons of the strangers shall build up thy walls, and their kings shall minister unto thee. For in my wrath I smote thee, but in my favor have I had mercy upon thee. Oh, praise be to God. We'll read one more portion here in chapter 49. Isaiah 49. We'll have to close because of the time. In Isaiah 49, verse 18. Lift up thine eyes round about, and behold, all these gather themselves together and come to thee. As I live, saith the Lord, thou shalt surely clothe thee with them all as with an ornament. As a, and bind them on thee as a bride doeth. Let us rejoice and be glad, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his wife hath made herself ready. And it was granted unto her that she should be arrayed in fine white linen, clean and white. Those garments are the righteous deeds of the saints. What have you done for Jesus? What are you doing for Jesus? Will you be clothed on that wedding day? We all want to be there at the wedding day. They all came, and the Lord of the wedding feast looked, and he saw a man who was not dressed with his wedding garment. He said, how did you get in here without that wedding garment? Well, he was speechless. He had nothing to answer. He could have said, well, I was born again, born in the water, born in the spirit, and I belong to one of the best churches in town. That's how I got in. Yes, but where's your wedding garment? He had nothing to say. Bind him hand and feet, cast him out into outer darkness, where there be weeping and gnashing of but the bride hath made herself ready. And what are these ornaments? Girls like to dress up. I was surprised when I got to Borneo. Oh, how the women were decked up, jewelry all over them, and all kinds of jewelry. I spoke about the bride of Christ, how God likes simplicity and humility. And immediately, oh, these girls took their necklaces and hid them inside their blouse, and they went like this. <laughs> you can see right away they were responding to the word of God. What are the jewelries we should have? Souls that we have won. Souls that we have won to Christ. Souls that we have won. You say, well, I don't know how to witness. I don't know the language. I tell you, God knows your language and you can pray. You can pray for souls. You can pray for the nations. You can pray for the islands of the sea. And you'll be surprised when these souls come. Verse 19, for thy waste and thy desolate place and the land of thy destruction shall even be too narrow by reason of the inhabitants and they that swallow thee up shall be far away and the children which thou shalt have after thou hast lost the other. Some dear mothers are weeping, some dear fathers also. They've brought up children and they've rebelled against. Some of our dear families have gone back to India. They came here for fame and fortune and they lost their children in the streets of New York. Gone back to India to visit some of them, their children. I said, how are your children? We don't know. They're somewhere in the streets of New York on drugs. The children which thou shalt have after thou hast lost the other shall say again in thine ears, the place is too straight for me. Give place to me that I may dwell. Then shalt thou say in thine heart, who hath begotten me these, seeing I have lost my children, and am desolate, a captive, and removing to and fro? Who hath brought up these? Behold, I was left alone. These, where had they been? 
Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I will lift up mine hand to the Gentiles. I will set up my standard to the people, and they shall bring thy sons in their arms, and thy daughters shall be carried upon their shoulders, and kings shall be thy nursing fathers. That is to say, they will bring your children, having they're caring for your children, and others, queens, thy nursing mothers, and they shall bow down to thee with their face toward the earth, and lick up the dust at thy feet, and thou shalt know that I am the Lord, for they shall not be ashamed that wait for me. What have you done with your life? What will you have to show the Lord when he comes? Oh, we thank God for blessing our youth. Young people, I'm so happy for you. And I want to go to girls camp next week, and, and next month, and next year. <laughs> next week, hopefully, I'd love to go. I want to get blessed too. Praise be to God. Will you let me come? That's good. God has blessed me through the years. I don't have some of the blessings you all have talked about. A lot of things I have not gotten in life. A lot of things other preachers get I don't have television program, radio, big crowds, all this and that. But those things don't really matter, do they? What matters is that you should do the will of God and that I should do the will of God. John the Baptist, he didn't get much out of life, get his head cut off. Jeremiah, poor fellow, preached his whole life, not one convert, perhaps only Baruch. But now look at them. Now look at them. Now look at John the Baptist. Oh, now look at Jeremiah. Oh, praise God. They're all going to be there at the wedding supper of the Lamb. And they're going to be shining, and they're going to be smiling, and they're going to be rejoicing. John's head will be back on his head, yes, don't worry about that. Jeremiah, uh, his prison wounds and all that, they'll all be shining bright, don't worry about that. They'll be there in glory, and they'll all be there when the trumpet sounds and the great uh, heavenly choirs begin to sing as the bridegrooms come marching in, and all their heads will turn. And there they will see the bridegroom, Jesus Christ, in all his resplendent glory. And by his side, the bride, come marching in. That's eternal life, children. New York will be burned up. New York will be gone. America will be destroyed. This world will have passed away. The sun, moon, and stars will be gone. But they that do the will of God. They shall shine forever as stars in God's kingdom. Let's all stand, shall we? Thank God for these blessings he's given us. And let's just give our lives back to him. Lord, we're the field of the Lord. We're the vineyard of the master. And Lord, you planted us in a good field, Lord. And you poured in good water. And you've sent down good sunshine. And Lord, you've given us a holy seed, O oh God. And you want fruit unto holiness, Lord God, and we want to give that to you. Let's just give our lives to God this morning and say, Lord, I want to be fruitful in the knowledge of the Lord. I want to be clothed with thy glory, O oh God. Give me souls, Lord God. Give me souls. Lord, I want to be a witness for thee. I want to be a fisher of men. Lord, maybe I cannot go to the mission fields, Lord, but I want to go in my prayer life, Lord. Give me a prayer life. Give me the spirit of grace and supplication, Lord. And Lord, here I'm spending for myself, Lord. I want to spend for the work of the Lord, for the mission fields, Lord God. Oh, God, I want my life to count for you. I want my life to count in the church. I want to labor for the Lord. I want to do something for you, Lord God. Oh, plant my life, Lord God. Make me a corn of wheat, Lord. Let me die to myself and die to this present world and die to the flesh, yeah, and die to the devil, Lord God, who comes in to corrupt and steal and rob and to destroy. No, I want to keep that which you've given me, Lord. Not just get a blessing this camp and maybe next year get a nothing Lord I want to keep it all year long Lord I want to keep the fires burning Lord God I want to keep the first love Lord God I want to keep the vision before me Lord that my life must be lived out for the glory of God oh give your life to Jesus give your life to God pour it out at his feet give back to him what he's given to you and he'll multiply it and he'll keep it for life eternity and he'll cause it to grow and bring forth eternal glory oh Jesus praise you praise you praise you praise you praise you thank you for your blessings thank God. let's all thank God for the many many blessings given us yes Lord praise you 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 we praise you Lord God we praise you for the sunshine we praise you for the rain we praise you for the born again we praise you for water baptism we praise you for the Holy Spirit Lord God Praise you, Jesus, for gifts of prophecy, Lord, and revelations. Praise you, Lord God. Praise you, Lord God. Our church building here isn't much to speak about, kind of dumpy. But God really, as pastor, as a 
Dr. Stafford said God has brought us to the true church, the best church. I don't mean that in comparison to others, no. There's only one church, and that's the church of the living God. But let's praise God for bringing us to his church, to his family, to his house. Yes, Lord God, we thank you. We praise you. We bless you. We thank you, Jesus. Yes, Lord God, you've given us a good church. Good ministers, Lord God, we praise you for the servants of God. Oh, Lord God, we thank you. 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 From this little church here, this is a little congregation, really. Look how many missionaries we've sent, all different places and so forth. Really, we've had a blessed privilege to do that. Let's just thank God for all the servants of God that have gone out from here to serve God in different places. Lord, we praise you. We thank you, Lord, for the missionaries. We thank you, Lord, for those that have gone. And, Lord, in serving you in different places, Lord, we praise you for giving them fruit, Lord God, and causing them to multiply, Lord God. Lord, we thank you. Lord, we thank you. I hope the brother will forgive me, but Brother Bob and Sister Mark, do pray for them. Of course, they've been heartbroken when they saw their daughter go away from them. People no doubt point the fingers and blame here and blame there, but in the Bible, God says, I have brought up children, and they have rebelled against me. Oh, God has gone through this pain, we know. I was talking to Bob and Mark recently and talking about it, you know, and then God showed us that from that little work up in Canada, so many, many souls have gone out to serve the Lord. And so that verse, uh, after I've lost these children, God will give me many more. And it's true, sometimes we lose our physical children, but God will give us children in the Spirit. So let's thank God for all the souls that have come out from our little churches. We don't have big buildings, we don't have great big ministries. But praise God, a lot of souls have come out to serve the Lord. Let's praise God for all the souls God has given. Father, we thank you, Lord, for all the sons and all the daughters you've given us, Lord, to serve you, Lord, to rise up and do something for you, Father. We thank you for multiplying us. We thank you for giving us increase, Father. Lord, in Jesus' sweet, precious name, the promise of God is there'll be none barren in our midst. It's not God's will that any dear child of God should be fruitless. And I believe God wants to make everyone in this room fruitful in the knowledge of the Lord, bringing forth fruit, and God will say, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thy talent multiply, whether it's through the, uh, through the uh, exchangers or whether it is one way or another, or whether the corn of wheat will fall on the ground and die. God is going to bring fruit out of every life in this room. Let's praise God for making all of us fruitful in the knowledge of the Lord. Lord, we thank you. Lord, we praise you. Lord, we bless you, Lord, that everyone, everyone should do the will of God. Everyone should do the will of God. Now, some of you are struggling, halting between two opinions. You sense God's will is in a certain direction, but you have a mind in another direction, and your brothers, your sisters, your friends, your daddy, your mama, your wife, your husband are pulling you in another direction. You're caught between two opinions. The world to come is calling you with its glory. And this world, the God of this world, is showing you the glory of things down here, enticing you in that direction. Remember how the devil came to Jesus and showed him all the glories of all the kingdoms of the world. He said, all of it's yours. Just do my will. Jesus said, no. Oh, no. I come to do the Father's will. What are you going to do? Going to go your own way? Make your own plans? Please your friends or your family? Follow the course of this world, dance to the tune of the God of this world, or are you going to do the will of God and abide forever? They that do the will of God, they shall abide forever. God speaking to your heart today, you know what the will of God is. Our Dr. Stafford was a very famous doctor. He said now he wants to be a pastor. Hallelujah. <laughs> Which is, is better. You know what the Bible says? Pastors, shepherds are an abomination to the Egyptians. Foolishness caring for dumb sheep. Why should our brother waste his life taking care of dumb sheep? Much better to be cutting somebody up on the operating table, isn't it? Or is it? We can cut people up and take out their heart, put somebody else's heart, it may be a bad boon's heart. But you can't put God's heart in there. Only God can do that. What's God's purpose for your life? What's the will of God for your life? Pray right now. Pray like Jesus prayed. Not my will, but thine be done. Not my will, but thine be done. 
Maybe he's calling you to be a corn of wheat. Just to lose everything. Just pour your life out at the feet of Jesus. Planted somewhere, maybe on the islands of the sea somewhere. No one, one, might, no one might know about you. Nothing, no books written about you. No pictures taken. Just dying somewhere out in a little field. But you'll be surprised on that day when God shall call. And they'll bring your sons from afar. They will gather themselves to you. And you'll have to enlarge the stakes of your tent. Your habitation will be enlarged. Your eternal dwelling place will be great and big because of all the souls that God will bring. And you'll be adorned as a bride for her husband with the souls that God has given you. Don't be ashamed to pour out your life unto death at the feet of Jesus. Oh, that's what life is all about. That's what life is all about. Jesus, 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 Jesus. If you want to say to the Lord, Lord, I give up my plans, not my will, but thine be done. You can come up front here and kneel down and we'll pray a few minutes. We'll close the meeting, but those that want to stay and pray, don't let the moment pass by. If you're in the battle between two opinions and you find the world pulling one way and the flesh the one way and the Spirit of God pulling in another direction, yield to the Spirit of God today. Yield to the life that's in the vine, that God may bring forth fruit unto holiness in the end, everlasting life.